The Monerotopia Weekly News segment is sponsored by WizardSwap.io, a non-custodial cryptocurrency exchange. All right, we're already uh, putting that sponsorship to get to good good use. We got WizardSwap up there, who will now be our new sponsor for the next couple of weeks. Tony, awesome. what's going on, man? Hey guys, good. It took me a little bit to load that because I saw news and then wizard, and I was like, wizard, is that the one? <laughs> yeah, you yeah. updated it, so that's awesome. Yeah, we just updated it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's uh, take it away. Let's try to run through the news pretty quick so we can get to viewers on stage. If if uh, Luke has the time to stick around, and then some people can throw some questions out there. Sure, of course. And since we have Luke, uh, hey Luke, and hey everybody. So if you want to chime in to anything that we're gonna discuss, you know, please go ahead. Um, and first of all, guys, like and share. Um, it does help a lot. We have 61 people watching on YouTube, 31 likes. So go ahead and like if you haven't yet. Uh, for the first thing, we're going to discuss Archetype Market, which is the largest darknet market currently announcing um, a valid PGP public key is now required and to FA by default. So uh, for the old users of the dark, no dark market, um, that's not necessary. But if you're a new user, uh, it is required to use PGP and a two-factor authentication. And for the old users, if you don't have a PGP nor a 2FA enabled, um, then it's recommended that, that you do and go ahead and do it. And they have 420,000 users. Yeah, that's so, that's what I that's what I found most uh, impressive about that that post. That's what I want to highlight there. Wow, that's that's a lot of um, real-world Monero users. Using it for whether you not agree with what they're what they're doing with it, um, those are people that are actually using Monero. So go ahead, Tony. Yep. Then um, so the, <laughs> I thought this post was really interesting. So Satoshi Van uh, Saberhagen. So he said that ninety nine percent of his portfolio is Bitcoin, and that he's going to stack Monero from now on. He's going to be focused on Monero. <laughs> so that, that was on April twenty first. Um, so he said he's going to hold Bitcoin, you know, but from now on, he's just going to focus on, on Monero. Now he's saying on April 28th, so it took him like a week, uh, he sold all his Bitcoin <laughs> for Monero, the only cryptocurrency whose community is willing to fight the regula regulators. I'll gladly go down with this ship or face criminalization alongside my fellow pirates. So within one week, this person went from 99% uh, of my portfolio is Bitcoin, but I'm interested in Monero from now on, and I'm going to stack Monero. <laughs> and one week later, he sold all his Bitcoin for Monero, which is actually what I did when I first learned about Monero a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I, it's, it's like falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. You get that same, uh, it's that same gravity that pulls you in with Monero. It's that same feeling of like, oh my God, this is that realization when you realize why you need Monero. Uh, it was similar to the realization of, of when I first got into Bitcoin, right? Same, same. I was so pulled into Bitcoin. Have that aha moment. Yeah, exactly. And I think anybody that is looks bait, but still funny, has gone bad. <laughs> I don't know. Regardless if it's bait or not, you know, it still should inspire people to look into Monero or probably do the same if they if they will. There's a there's a lot a lot of people on the that are you know opening their eyes to Monero right now. We're seeing it on Twitter. Um, you know, this is the most extreme instance, somebody who's saying that they, uh, sold all their Bitcoin for Monero, but I'm just seeing in general, a lot of people on Twitter showing interest in Monero and considering moving over to it. Um, it's, 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 it's very exciting to see. I mean, you know, you're, we're still seeing, uh, laser eyed Bitcoiners throw some of the same criticisms they've always thrown in the past. Uh, basically, what is the criticism at this point? I mean, it's it's kind of weird in Bitcoin. It's like you have those that are are, are saying, you know, they, they just don't care about the privacy aspects. Really, they're like, well, Bitcoin uh, is is replacing uh, fiat, and they don't really care that it's completely traceable. Uh, there's that argument, and so you're never gonna get those people to to, to find interest in Monero, but there's a big swath of big Bitcoin people that are like, wait a minute, I thought we were building something that was also supposed to be digital cash. And so those people are now uh, finding their way to Monero because there's, there's a really running out of other options. 
Samurai Wallet shut down, Wasabi Wallet shut down. These were the largest tools that people, uh, tools, platforms that were being used in Bitcoin for obtaining privacy. They don't exist any longer. So you have these people that were interested in using Bitcoin in a digital cash-like way that no longer are, are essentially able to do it. You can still do it in other ways, but it's not nearly as, as user-friendly. Um, and so they're, they're realizing if I, if I want to um, have that user experience, if I want a, a tool that performs the function of digital cash, I have to use Monero. And honestly, it's no better time to get into Monero in terms of price versus Bitcoin. So these people should consider themselves very lucky that are having this realization only now when it's slapping them in the face. Mm -hmm. uh, and they should have had the realization years ago. Uh, you should just don't realize, realize how, how uh, lucky you are that you're realizing this at a time when Monero is like historically low against Bitcoin. It's like I almost feel like not not promoting Monero on this point. Like you don't deserve to discover it here. Uh, so if you're on the fence, consider yourself very lucky that you've, uh, you know, been slapped in the face at this moment in time, because it's a good, t it's a, it also happens to be an opportune time uh, price wise to get into Monero versus Bitcoin. Really good points. And it's actually a good segue for us to go into Wasabi Waller and then what Seth posted. But what Doc said is a really, really good point. This is the best time to get into Monero just because of Bitcoin is really high and Monero is low. So if you were to sell your Bitcoin, you would have you would get a lot of a lot of Monero in exchange. So this is the best time to do it. And um, when you orient yourself to human liberty, it, people tend to when they look into Monero, just like it happened to me, Doug, and you know a lot of other people or that person, um, you look into Monero and then you quickly realize, why do I have Bitcoin? I want to sell all of it and just, just get into Monero fully. So um, I'm really happy that it happened for that person. And um, hopefully more people are going to follow through. But yeah, like Doug said, in Wasabi Wallet. So uh, they are now going to have, they're shutting down its coin join coordination service effective June 1st. So that's a really, really big thing. Um, even without coin joins, Wasabi's client side filtering architecture, Tor integration, and custom coin selection make it the most private light wallet available. But, however, the nature of the Bitcoin blockchain prevents users from obtaining complete privacy without coin joins. So this is and this is going to affect Trezor's um, BTC based server. So it's going to affect, you know, quite quite a few um, wallets. Now, wait, read the la last line of their their blog posts about shutting down. Uh, the day will come when someone will write the code to perfect all the properties of good money. <laughs> <laughs> Until <Wow>. then. <laughs> Until then. And let us be grateful for what we have accomplished together. Be mindful. Of we, we, we had Nopara. I had Nopara on the show famously wow. or infamously a few months ago. Uh, he's, he's very well of the fact that that code does exist. Somebody has invented it. Uh, Luke Parker is currently working on upgrading it and making it more unstoppable and untraceable than ever. Um, so yeah, yeah, there, there was his, I don't know if that was just supposed to be kind of like a, a dig at Monero there. I don't, I don't know what's going on there. That's kind of funny though. Yeah. I'll write a code. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, yeah, but that's unfortunate, but then it exists. It's Pro I protocol mean, it level pri default privacy exists. It does. And it's only going to get better. Um, now, Seth posted, he said, I, he doesn't give a flying fuck about mass adoption or Monero's exchange rate with Bitcoin. Um, like he just cares about real humans being able to spend their money as they see fit without surveillance or permission. And that's very important within our community as well, not to get attached to the name Monero and everything, and just to always follow the tool that will be able to do this, which is allow you to use money as you want without surveillance or permission. This is the most important thing. Um, he said Bitcoin was good enough in many situations thanks to Samurai Wallet and maybe Wasabi Wallet or Ceph, but now there are no tools available outside of a better GUI for a joint market with no battle testing. Bitcoin is not good enough anymore. Um, it's, it's sad. Um, and I hope people will realize what's happening right now within the Bitcoin privacy space. 
and that they will discover Monero. And actually, I'm going to skip a couple one couple articles that we have, and I'll go directly into into Edward Snowden. Uh, it's a short clip, but he says, "I've been warning Bitcoin developers for ten years that privacy needs to be provided for for at the protocol level." This is the final warning. The clock is ticking. So let's go ahead and watch this. Enough. You have to have this stuff in the protocol. It has to happen on chain. Uh, and that's where you see things like, yeah, Monero is, is great. I, I use Monero. Right? Cool. But the, it's interesting. Like when we tried to get him on the show, when we offered to pay him in Monero, he uh, he asked for quite a large sum as well. And this is not to talk badly of, of Edward, Edward Snowden. It's just that when uh, he got invited onto, onto the show and uh, we were going to effectively pay him on Monero, he refused. They, they just scratched everything off. And then the moment they heard Monero, they just um, went in, in a different direction. So, uh, well, the but, yeah, the excuse was that he he had gotten busy and, you know, well, yeah, may, maybe it's true, but it was a weird coincidence that they showed he showed interest uh, and was asking for twenty five thousand or and, and, and when we said, all right, we'll we'll pay you, but it'll be in Monero. Uh, that's when the kind of the, the deal went went south right. um but yeah we'd love to still we'd love to get him as a remote speaker at Monerotopia. so uh we are reaching out would be amazing now more than ever would be the time for uh snowden to come out and talk about why why monero matters especially since he used to work for the government but now he works for the public so he needs to support us we need this help in any way we he can so that'll be really awesome That'll be really, really cool. Um, okay, so we discussed these stuff. Now let's go into this article by Chila. So this is very interesting. So basically the UK having the power to seize your crypto asset without requiring to make an arrest. They can just seize your passwords or memory stick or anything that could give them the information to help with the investigation. Um, they can just basically transfer your, unquote, illicit crypto assets. And then they can do whatever they want with it. They can you know, destroy it. They can return it to circulation. If it's not, um, okay, if it's going to into it circulation is not conductive to the public good. So if it's not conductive to the public good, they can destroy it. Allegedly, uh, privacy coins, for example, are a form of crypto cryptocurrency that grant an extremely high degree of anonymity and are often used for money laundering. Uh, now, are they going to use this for the good to actually try to track criminals and illicit uh, payments? Mm, I don't think they're going to use the power just for that. I think this is just more so of an excuse. And yeah, but, uh, but what's, what's most interesting here is that, you know, that they're the UK government is saying whenever they confiscate Monero, they destroy it. Yeah. So how, <laughs> Which is, uh, how, do, you, how do you destroy it? That That's... <laughs> Well, it, it's it's pretty it's pretty crazy thought too, right? I mean, um, this this could have an effect on how how much Monero exists, right? If if the policy of governments becomes that when they obtain Monero, uh, it effectively gets destroyed, right? They send it to, uh, an, uh, they they lose the private keys, but you know, uh, are we we're then then trusting governments that they've actually, uh got into a boating accident and, and lost their Monero. So mm -hmm. it's it's just it's just interesting um, the dynamics that that will could ultimately end up playing on, on Monero. Which they, <laughs> they're not destroy, they're not destroying their Bitcoin. That's for sure. I mean, uh, we've seen in, in years past some of the largest confiscations of any asset that have ever occurred has been of Bitcoin billions of dollars worth. And what does the government do? They then turn around and auction it off. Uh, whereas with Monero, uh, at least the, the UK government is coming out and saying, uh, we don't auction it off. We don't put it back in the market. We do, we quote unquote destroy it. We take it off the market. Um, so reducing Monero's supply. Um, so it's just, it's interesting to see. And uh, I've heard or seen statements about that with regards to the US as well. Mm. But here's where the tail emission comes into play because um, Monero is still going to, with the tail emission, we're still going to emit Monero. So even 
uh, it is going to affect Monero if that if that happens and it sees quite a good amount of it. But uh, the fact that it's we don't cap the supply helps with people losing uh, their Monero or the situation. Right, like this there, there, it, there would never be a problem of not having enough Monero because we were always absolutely. creating. We're saying this this is just uh, an argument uh, that's uh, you know towards this you know towards the scarcity of Monero. Right, these are one of the criticisms mm -hmm. that are that are against Monero, it doesn't have the 21 million cap. It has a tail emission. Obviously, we know we know why it has a tail emission. There's mm -hmm. benefits, uh, critical benefits that come with that tail emission. And we're really not losing uh, scarcity on the other end. It's just it takes some abstract thinking to realize Monero is very, very scarce. It's extremely hard money. Um, it's not infinite in supply unless there's an infinite amount of time. <laughs> it's limited at any point in time and actually it may be more limited than you think uh <laughs> because monero gets lost and if it becomes a currency that's actually uh, a cryptocurrency that's actually used there'll be more transactions made on chain and more opportunities for coins to get lost mm -hmm. and then there's other things like this that are playing into it governments uh confiscating monero and then saying that they would not not put it back on the market uh, so it just becomes uh, kind of pos positive arguments as to why uh, Monero is is arguably very scarce. Absolutely. Uh, Gombat said, seems they haven't heard of the concept of divis divisibility. Lol, we're not running out of Monero anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, oof, okay, let's get into the next one now. So uh, this is interesting. Roger were charged with uh, mail fraud, tax evasion, and filing false ta tax returns, wanted for extradition to the United States. Um, and then Dan Held wrote, good, he's been a net negative for Bitcoin. And then Eric wrote down below, this big will take Dan, uh, WTF. And let's go ahead and open this link from the justice.gov. So, um, Essentially, he ev evaded nearly fifty million dollars in taxes. Um, accused, accused of evading. Accused. This is this is this is just crazy. So we were just talking last show on. I was just talking about Roger Ver and how we we were in talks to try to get him to come to Monerotopia. He's uh, oh. he works closely with Zano. Actually, um, he was involved indirectly in, in Monerotopia last year in some ways. And uh, we were close to potentially have him come to Monero Topi. He actually, on a spaces where I was speaking to him, he said he would he would come. That's when it was in Argentina. Then we moved it to Mexico. So there was no confirmation. And then uh, this happened. So doubt oh. we'll be seeing Roger at Monero Topia, which is very unfortunate. Uh, but the level of disrespect that some of these quote unquote Bitcoiners had for this guy is just uh, disgusting. Um, I understand there were differences. There was the fork. Roger, I don't know, worked on, uh, invested perhaps in some companies that, I don't know, disagreed with some of his, his, his investments, whatever it may be. But he did more for Bitcoin uh, early growth, early adoption than arguably anybody else. I mean, he was, he was the Bitcoin Jesus. He was the first kind of regular, non-super techie guy that was in, in it for... Uh, libertarian principles that realized, holy shit, this thing that these these nerds invented um, is can 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 replace fiat money, and he was one of the first to kind of realize this, and then convey that message to the normies, not even normies, other the other early adopters, and and start conveying that message to those that were uh, always looking for something to replace fiat. Um, and he, he did a tremendous job at that. And then also, uh, gave so gave back so much to the ecosystem. He was an entrepreneur constantly investing in, in new companies. Um, you know, I think he was an investor in Coinbase investor, you know, Roger Ver had his hands in, in so many things, uh, in, in positive ways and in, in the, in the funding that he provided. And uh, at some point, uh, I think it was in 2014, he he renounced his U.S. citizenship and left the country mm -hmm. and he paid an exit tax on the way out because the way it works uh, in the United States, 
Um, you, you basically have to pay for your freedom. Um, and so when you, if you renounce your U.S. citizenship, you have to then pay off, pay, make, it, make a payment to the country, I guess, based on uh, the value of what your assets are at that time. Uh, he did all that and uh, left. And then at 10 years later, he's now being accused of essentially, I guess, not making the proper payment, I, I think is what it's really boiling, boiling down to. Um, so just, in, just incredible. Um, but I think that the, mo the, the biggest takeaway here is realizing uh, how poisoned a big part of the Bitcoin community is in that they just completely lack any respect for this guy, whether or not he's ultimately guilty of these things. Um, you know, that will be decided in a, in a court of law. Uh, but what we know about Roger Ver is he is an extremely principled person who is in crypto for the right reasons before anyone else and was out there spreading the, these ideas and bringing people into crypto for the purpose of creating peer-to-peer -peer digital cash and to not have respect for, for that person. Um, I don't know, I think just, just shows a, 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 a lack of, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's hubris and it's, it just shows a lack of intelligence for, for some of these quote unquote Bitcoiners. It is despicable behavior. And then on to, to add on to what uh, Doug said. So it says that in total, Vera is alleged to have caused a loss to the IRS. So a loss of the IRS of at least 48 million. And it's interesting how these things work because you work so Yeah. A loss to the IRS. It's a loss to the IRS. So Roger did his own research, put his own effort and sweat into making the right decisions to make money. Um, and now he's he, he's alleged to have caused a loss of the IRS of at least forty eight million. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Besides, um... he's he's a fascinating guy. I interviewed him. I, I recommend checking out that interview from a couple of years ago. Um, that's when I kind of really first learned that he was more into Monero than I even than I even knew. You know, he's he's a, a big Monero advocate, by the way. Uh, obviously, because it is the currently the most used form of peer to peer digital cash for people that are actually using it for those purposes of making, you know, untraceable cash transactions. And, and Roger is, is absolutely not in denial of that. He completely supports it. And he's a, he's a Monero fan. Um, Gombat saying he realized Bitcoin could end war and dedicated his life to it. Yeah. He was, he was very passionate about what uh, the implications of, of digital uh peer-to-peer -peer cash can be he's he's a really interesting guy i recommend checking out some of uh, that interview or other interviews that uh where he kind of tells his story of how he got into to bitcoin and his story of who he was before he got into bitcoin pretty interesting i mean he was in he was in jail he was in federal prison for i think 11 months for selling uh fireworks he was running a business <laughs> that was selling fireworks and if you listen to the story i mean uh, he really, it w really was not breaking any law in any egregious way. Other people were doing it, getting away, but, but he, he became, um, uh, basically they wanted to make an example of him because he was, he was very public in his disdain for the state, uh, out there, you know, which is what, what a lot of people are out here doing these days. I think a lot of people on this channel do. Uh, and so he was a target because of his his political opinions and his disdain for the state. And so I recommend people taking a closer look at Roger Ver. Plus the last thing, he did so much to onboard people into Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and uh, to try businesses to accept. And he did a lot, a lot of work. So yeah, it's very, it's very unfortunate what happened. Um, on to our next thing. So this is an interesting take of, um, a ransomware payment made on March 1st by United Health. So um, it's a 22 million ransomware, ransomware payment. It was paid in Bitcoin on March 3rd. The funds began to move later that day. Monero began getting transaction spent. Perhaps the, the, that Bitcoin was swapped into XMR and chain analysis pursued. To be clear, this is all speculation, but it's plausible that law enforcement watched its own Bitcoin move to a website where it was then traded into Monero. And because one method of attacking Monero is through spam, decided to flood Monero with fake transactions. Spamming transactions allow investigators to lower the size of the ring signatures and harm anonymity. 
by owning owning a great majority of spans, you f- you fill ring signatures with your dummy spans. It's one of the primary reasons Monero will upgrade to full chain membership proofs soon. Um, so this is an interesting take on on what happened recently with the Monero spam spam attack, and um, let's see. Yeah, and then FBI has 50 million bounty on Black Hat currently, which is the actor behind the attack. Could be. I mean, that, that, that could be what the uh, the spam attack was all about. It's a good, it's a good theory. <laughs> it's, he did some custom research into this, actually. It's interesting, but it could be. could be a, pl- a plausible uh, theory. Then uh, we've heard about this a lot of times. The majority of the EU parliament will later today approve far-reaching new anti-money laundering laws. Uh, we discussed this quite a bit in the past, but essentially anonymous cash payments over 3,000 euro will be banned in commercial transactions. Cash payments over 10,000 euro will even be completely banned in business transactions. Uh, and this is a war on cash. The thing is that that is very interesting. So uh, the commission asked the public for their opinion on limiting cash payments in 2017. More than 90% of responding citizens spoke out against such a step. So nobody wanted cash to be restricted uh, because they considered uh, cash an essential personal freedom and that restrictions on payments in cash are ineffective in achieving the potential objectives, which are fight against criminal activities, terrorism, and tax evasion. Uh, According to an uh, ECB survey, up to 10% of citizens use cash even for amounts greater than 10,000 euro buying cars. So this is effectively a war on cash and trying to get uh, the eurozone into the CBDC slowly by limiting cash and then eventually getting rid of cash. Um, but it's just interesting how they've e- even conducted a survey in which they ask people, do you want this to happen? Do you still want cash? And people are like, yeah, we want cash. We we need cash. We like anonymity. And then a few years later, okay, well, <laughs> we're going to restrict it and eventually abolish it even. So... <laughs> It's the war on um, cash and the war on digital cash, 100%. Yeah, for sure. Now, th- this one is really interesting as well. So a vast new data set could supercharge the AI hunt for crypto money laundering. So um, Elliptic uh, partnered with MIT and IBM, and they released a new AI model. This one is much larger than the one they had previously. The previous one had 200,000 uh, transactions in the data set. This one is trained on 200, on 200 million transactions. Um, as far as I'm aware, this is actually public. The data set is public. And uh, it aims to spot the shape of Bitcoin money laundering. And how effective is it? How how good is this model? So it's actually pretty good, according to them. Uh, before, they, would, they were able to identify 0.1% of the transactions as being illicit and actually identify them. Now it's more, more uh, one out of four. Um, which is which is a large jump. It's still it's not one hundred percent accurate. They can identify. I think they said a twelve or fourteen out of fifty two of the customer accounts. They can identify whether they're suspicious or not. But again, it may not sound high, but compared to where they were before, where allegedly only zero point one percent of the exchanges accounts were flagged as potential money laundering, um, is quite a big, uh, quite a big jump, and they've made quite a, quite a uh, big progress. Which again, it just shows. Um, how important Monero is and how important it is to have privacy on the fundamental level. Um, they're, yeah, I mean, they, they, they're, they're ramping up, increasing their ability on the technological level on how to track and trace Bitcoin um, to use the, the transparent chain and to, to, you know, to use AI to, to better uh, gather the data. And, you know, Bitcoin is obviously being attacked on all these other fronts too, where there's, there's effectively no way to use pri- Bitcoin privacy tools in Bitcoin to thwart those that are trying to track and trace you. Uh, and then they're uh, limiting the ways for you to even obtain Bitcoin without, you know, essentially KYC. So it's, it's being attacked on all fronts and the end result is a, traceable crypto a a uh, central bank digital cryptocurrency that may not effectively uh may not directly be controlled by the government but run in such a way where it's defanged 
and it works in concert with governments, with the state, in a way where they're no longer threatened by it. Hmm. They've made such incredible pro uh, progress over the past couple of years when it comes to these these things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And essentially, the only now it should be pretty clear that the only tool for liberty is Monero because everything else is just KYC and it's, it's just dangerous to to use in in general. So um, yeah, I, I think eventually um, we're gonna have an exponential growth in Monero based on what's happening, hopefully, if people actually care about liberty and things of that nature. I was gonna say this, we have 8-bit, eight, eight hey guys, it's my first time watching the show. I appreciate everything all of you guys are doing for privacy and Monero. I have taken too long to adopt it myself and have been doing the work to make the switch. Yeah, man, there's, uh, there's a lot of you and thanks for jumping on and uh, try to join us on viewers on stage if you can, give us your, your story. You don't have to turn your camera on. We'd love to hear how you arrived at Monero. And it's never too late, it, you know, to get into Monero 8-bit. So whether you get in today, tomorrow, it doesn't matter. As long as you make that switch and, you know, that's the most important part. Um, now, <laughs> so Wyoming Senator slams um, DOJ stake on non-custodial crypto software, vows to protect user rights. And there's not much information in this, but this is basically what she's going to do. So uh, Cynthia Loomis said, I'm deeply troubled by the Department of Justice's high progressive argument that non-custodial software can constitute a money transmission service. Uh, this stance con contradicts existing treasury guidance, common sense, and violates the rule of law. Um, arguments against self-custody software threaten the fundamental property rights that are core to being an American, she said. And she also wrote that she will do everything she can to fight for your rights to hold your own keys and run your own code a uh, node. Um, so hopefully she's gonna make good progress when it comes yeah, to this. Yeah, it's 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 nice to see. I mean, like we said, we need to fight this on all ends. So here's some, you know, she's always appeared to be somebody who's actually in it for the principles. Um, so cool to see. Obviously, she's not out there talking about Monero, uh, but nice to see that she's out there supporting essentially the the Bitcoin privacy tools uh I, I don't know if she's worded as in support of bitcoin privacy tools but you know wrapped up in the fact that samurai was indicted is this idea that now they're they're changing the definition of what a money transmitter is regulators are now uh putting within that definition um you know uh wallets uh that uh you know uh, are are non are are non custodial um, and so it's it's a tremendous it's a tr it's a, a tremendous change in in how regulators have been treating um, you know the, the the wallets up to this point. So good to see that she's out there, but it's really going to be decided in a, in a court of law. We'll see what happens. You know, in the samurai indictment, we'll see what happens with tornado. This is where the law is being created. It's being created in the courts. And we're going to have to see what the end result is in terms of what new precedent is set in terms of what is considered a, a money transmitter. Hmm. We have in the YouTube section, uh, Willard saying, me too, I'm ashamed, but better late than never. The Monero community welcomes the last law. Thank you all. Yeah, it's, ne it's never too late and you shouldn't be ashamed for getting into Monero just now or it, it doesn't matter as long as you make you realize it and you inform other people that's that's the most important thing um when the house also said it's never too late to join monero it's never too late to join monero so now let's go into so let's play this video and then we'll go back on to this one and then uh, that'll be it for the new section so untraceable wrote bitcoin is institutional grade monero is freedom grade money for the people we're gonna play the whole Two minutes. None of them will ever be wrapped by a spot ETF. None of them will be accepted by Wall Street. None of them will be accepted by mainstream institutional investors as crypto assets. So in the DeFi report that you mentioned, we highlighted uh, lots of different types of technical features and compliance controls that can be built in at different layers of the ecosystem. This is the one universal consensus accepted 
institutional grade crypto asset in the world. But the more Bitcoin that's held in funds, the less that is available for users. Its use case as a digital currency is further away than ever. Okay, well, there'll be know your customer this, there'll be anti-money laundering that. A good place to start might be something like sanctions. OFAC has already stated in their compliance guidance that miners may already have sanction screening obligations. What that basically does is it transitions Bitcoin from a decentralized permissionless system into a centralized permission system where you basically have an IOU from the blacklist providers. There'll be some tax regulations, there'll be some back and forth over what you can do, there'll be concerns about privacy. Put another way, Wall Street did what Wall Street does best. It took a risky asset and made a market. It subsumed Bitcoin into the system. The fungibility in Bitcoin is actually worse than PayPal. People just trust Bitcoin. It's 200 times larger than Monero. So how do you think? It's not larger you... than Monero. It's not. It's it's nothing. You're talking about the fucking market. No, Monero is the only goddamn currency that's used. And in the worst case, you know, if, if everybody has to go to a central service to check if their bitcoins are valid or if they aren't, they have to sell them at a discount or that kind of thing. It's, this can eventually lead to a collapse and a loss of confidence. This is a <laughs> this is a really epic video. So oh, good, it's so oh good. God. Untraceable. He's a he's a creative genius, that man, and has such a he has such a good grasp of uh, Monero tech and Bitcoin tech. And this tells a lot about him. He said, somebody asked, am I allowed to download this clip and share it on your posts? Um, he said, yes, please do. Download it and share it wherever, wherever, wherever. No need to credit me. I'll have a link to a higher quality version in a few minutes as well. Amazing. <laughs> it's a good video. That, awesome. that, ad, that Adam Back, uh, those Adam Back clips are amazing. That's from an old, old video of, mm -hmm. you can find it on YouTube, obviously where he's it's in i think it's from like 2014 or something maybe even or like 2013 and he's talking about the the fungibility issues with bitcoin at that time and the the, the need for for bitcoin to to maintain its ability to be fungible um and obviously nothing has been done since so he you know back that back then adam back seemed to have cared about the need for bitcoin to be private and fungible um, and you know, n none of the things were, were implemented, you know, even conf confidential transactions, uh, which he helped create was never implemented into Bitcoin. And so there's, yeah. there's just been no, no improvement since, uh, to, to improve Bitcoin's fungibility. It's only gotten worse. Well, yeah. I mean, there were attempts, there were attempts with building Bitcoin privacy tools, but now we're seeing those things, uh, prove to not be practical. Given uh, given the fact that governments will can shut them down, it needs to be private and fungible on the protocol level. <laughs> and it's interesting whenever you hear Michael Saylor talk about Bitcoin, like he just like was was the point? He he makes it like if 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 you know about um. If you have certain qualities within yourself, you start to realize that what, what's the point in Bitcoin just by listening to Michael Saylor, because he makes it as a case against freedom to use Bitcoin, essentially. Yeah, um, he's he's completely well, pro regulation. Pro, he's like whatever Bitcoin needs to be for 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 basically governments and and large companies to be able to put it on their in their in their treasury. Right. And so that's all he cares about. He, he doesn't care if it's completely KYC'd, AML'd, and held in custody at all at Coinbase at that point. Uh, he wants it to be uh, completely accepted by regulators so that it can then be fiatized and it can go up in fiat value. Yeah, and beyond his metaphors and expressions with these cyber hornets, which are nodes and you know, all these oh God, metaphors that he's that fucking guy. I know. He just wants to pop his analogies. Uh, I know. The energetic field of the cyber horn is feeding onto consciousness. Yeah. Digital energy. Digital, yeah, yeah. Digital energy encrypted into Ugh. ether. Yeah.
Okay. Oh, this was good. Yeah, this is a good clip. This is, you know, this kind of, yeah, play, play play this one. This, this was just last night. They had a debate, a roundtable debate on Bitcoin versus gold. They spoke about a, a bunch of other stuff too. I, I recommend checking it out. It, it was fun. Um, and yeah, obviously Eric Voorhees was on the, the, I was the smartest guy in the room there, obviously. I, uh, I, I'm sure everybody here knows Eric Voorhees old school Bitcoiner wants to get another guy like a Roger Ver in for the right reasons. Uh, but you know, obviously it, it, extremely intelligent and, uh, a creator in the space has built some, some great companies. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a good debate to listen to, but like all, all debates with these gold bug guys, it always, it's always been coming down to the same thing for guys like, like Peter Schiff. And it's that, you know, Bitcoin has no utility. That's the that's the end argument that they're making. Is you know Peter Schiff's argument is, you, it, it's only it's it's only being used as a speculative asset, and it doesn't have any actual utility at the end of the day. And what the argument ends up boiling down to is like, well, no, it's it's censorship resistant digital cash. That's the that's the utility. And then there's always that realization, but is it? Because it doesn't seem to be working like that because it's completely traceable. So it's like, it's interesting that these gold bugs get that better than uh, some, some, of the, some of the Bitcoiners. But go ahead and play the, the clip. Uh, before I do that, um, if you go in the comment section, which is a bit funny. So um, all I saw were two old guys yelling at two young guys about how uncomfortable they are with change. To dinosaurs who just don't want to see or accept change, simple. Um, which, again, like Doug said, the gold bugs, I mean, they tend to understand these things better than the Bitcoiners and how, you know, it's really not censorship resistance. And don't get me wrong, Eric, Eric Voorhees does understand this, by the way. But go ahead, go ahead and uh, play that clip. Should I play? For, I think you said from minute three or. No, it was, oh no, no, no. It was like the three hour mark. It was like the three hour, zero, zero and 30 seconds, I think. Oh, well, cause I don't, this is just two hours. So the only two. How is that just two? Uh, really? Yeah. I saw three hours in there. Oh, maybe they cut off part of it. Oh, really? Oh, cause it had like an intro. Yeah, I don't know if you'll be able to find the time. Oh, so maybe it's like the, the intro and That's, being that's the link that I sent you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you remember like the topic or mm, Bitcoin decentralized, the Bitcoin gambling token and a scam? Oh, well, Peter should be wrong. <laughs> it's towards the end. Money laundering, cryptocurrency traceability. That will be interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. That might be it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That that. The bad guys, earlier. the bad oh. guys can track you even better. Eric, you, okay. can, you can, tra you can transfer the great file, you, you can, the great you file can, of China you, means that they know everything yeah. about you. you they you know can, what you do in private, in school, in the streets, on the train. They're not gods. Home, in your bedroom. They're not they, you can, they know okay, everything wait, 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 about wait, wait, you. Wait, 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 So that's the world of the papers. I'm sorry to say. Let Eric make his point. Let Eric make his point. Go ahead, Peter. I'm addressing his point. Yeah, you can you can transfer for Bitcoin, right? It's easier to transfer it, but it all depends on the value of what you're transferring. Is there going to be a market for it in the future? Is there going to be a price for it? The, the main reason there's a price for Bitcoin now is because people want to speculate on a future price appreciation. But if people lose confidence in that, if they don't think Bitcoin is, you know, you know going to go to the moon, if they, don't, they think it's topped out, the market's going to collapse. And so, yeah, you can transfer it, but what, it's gonna, what is it going to be worth when the guy gets it? And then what are they going to be able to sell it for? Really good point. Really good point. No. See, these no. are all scary yeah. questions that market participants have to deal with when they're actually using real assets. But you're, things you're, can be volatile and like, I'm not scared of prices. But you're and people that can't get paid other speed. ways. This is probably why your arguments are specious. Decline. But again, and again, you know, yeah. who's to say that I can't use a different crypto than, okay. than and you know, even though there's 20,000 other cryptos, whatever that exist today, and some of them maybe are better than Bitcoin, some are not, but somebody could come up with a new and better Bitcoin tomorrow that everybody said, hey, this is what we use. Forget about that old one. This isn't, one is newer, it's it better, it's faster. Isn't it great to have like actual innovation in markets and creativity and finance? But then what happens to the value of all your Bitcoin when nobody wants it anymore? Because there's something better. It could change. 
there is I mean, I, I mean, there's an innovation. There has been a revolution in payment system. All these fintech solution payment system did not exist in 2008 when Bitcoin was started. 15 years later, as I said, millions of people every day do billions of transactions using this fintech system. They have nothing to do with blockchain. But not in so Russia. Fact, not, huh? in Russia not, in, not in Russia. Not in not in Russia. Not in China. Not in China. They use Alipay, I mean, which I pay actually. Yeah, you go okay. to China. Nobody's using cash. How are you going to send okay? your Chinese? All over, all over Africa. All over Africa. Okay, where financial system, you don't bank branches. Everybody's using M-Pesa. Okay, so there's been a revolution that has allowed even the poor farmer in Africa to do payment system instantaneously, to microcredit and other things. This changed the lives of people. Bitcoin in Africa has not made any difference to anybody. Cool. I would I'm love to, to see. Say. I would love to see you send M Pesa from your penthouse in New York to someone in Africa. It's not possible. <laughs> no. I, I can do. I can do Venmo. The most important thing, not me to send M Pesa, but within Sub-Saharan Africa, the payment system has become essentially based on M Pesa, and that's a revolution for them. Okay. Look, I'm not. Okay? I'm not saying there shouldn't be other systems. And, and if there is a dictator in Nigeria. If you transfer your Bitcoin to a wallet that is on exchange in Nigeria, they can go and seize it. You're making they arguments go and against. Seize it. You're making That's arguments against third-party custodians. Huh? You're making arguments against third-party custodians. Of course, if you leave your Bitcoin with a third-party custodian, it's no different than leaving your money with a bank. That's Anyone who actually with the ETFs, you know, uh, in, That's not, wait, 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 everywhere on the wait. world, the regulation of uh, crypto, whatever you want to call them is based on having wallets that are maintained by can exchanges. I, I and question? they have to know exactly sure. what you have, so, so, so that if there is a tax liability, they can go to the exchange and say, Is there anything what that would it? change your mind, Noriel? What? Is there any, like, because you're a very smart guy, and we know. This is really interesting. Uh, let, 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 it go a little, let it go yeah. a little more. I think this is where he says it. Uh, yeah, it sucks. Smart, smart people, yeah. Yeah. tax change, smart people change yeah. their mind. Is there anything? You guys have yeah. both spoken in absolutes. It's a gambling token. What is happening in we think space. it's not a gambling token. No, no, no. I, so, I, what I, would change your mind? Okay. What fact would have to happen? Okay, so my that view, would change your my, mind. My view of the financial system payment. Let's not talk about asset management or capital market activity or insurance or lending. Payment systems in the future are going to be based, first of all, on having central bank digital currencies. They're not going to dominate everything. There'll be limit to how much you can have it in. Things. They're not going to have problems of privacy because in every democracy, we already found technological solution to make sure that the same way in which today, if a law enforcement authority, tax authority wants to do an audit on you, they know everything about you because they can go to the bank and find out everything you have. Same thing is going to happen when there is a CBDC. The government doesn't know what's there, but if there's a tax audit, they can find out. Okay, So there's not going to be any risk of the government taking over, knowing everything you're doing. That's bullshit. So you're going to have this system with CBDCs, first of all. Then you're going to have tokenized deposits because the banks don't want to be disintermediated. Tokenization of deposits probably is a good idea. People believe in stable coins. The problem with stable coins is they are literally going back to free banking. Whenever you have free banking, like in the 19th century, you can have things that are bubbled, they collapse, and then having lots of different monies doesn't make sense. The only way to avoid it, the regulation of stable coin is going to be, they have to be like a narrow bank. So if you have a stable coin, everything has to be 100% in short-term treasury that are safe. And then there will be other things that are part of the financial system, like the fintech and payment system. And then there'll be these crypto things. They're going to be whatever you want to call them. There'll be a small piece of this thing. They're not going to be currencies. They're not to do with payment system. For international transactions, there'll be stuff that occurs instantaneously. Once we have everybody's ID regulated, then you can transfer money knowing who is a criminal who is not. And that's going to happen because technology can allow to do this in five seconds like we do with Venmo. So that's going to be the payment system of the world, in which crypto is just a little piece of something, but doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That's what's going to be the so revolution not, in financial well, services not, nothing, in payments, well, so, and we can talk about well, other things if and, you want to. Well, Anthony, what, what would change your mind? Though you always ask me uh, what would change my mind and get me to.